Hi, I'm Steve Jobs. Believe it or not, Steve Jobs did not invent anything. He was neither an engineer nor a computer wizard nor a scientist. And yet without him, no one would ever have witnessed the Macintosh or the iMac. No one would ever have listened to music on an iPod or made a phone call using an iPhone. And of course, no one would ever have surfed on an iPad. Jobs did not design his products, but well before anyone else, he understood that they would change our lives. Take a look at the screen, and I can move the screen with just a touch. The coolest thing about iPod is that whole, your entire music library fits in your pocket. A phone and an internet communicator. This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. And here we are, right at the New York Times. You can see how fast it is. He presented each new product as an insight into the future, and he made it all so very cool. He was a visionary, an incredibly charismatic boss, and had excellent communication skills. But he was also authoritarian, ruthless, and a megalomaniac. It's just like this. Steve Jobs uh, envisions himself as one of the great cultural or political uh, world leaders of our time. There are a few special people in the world, the Shakespeare's, the Newtons, a few of them. And he saw himself as one of them, the way he talked about it. And everybody else are just ants, and they are worthless, and they don't mean anything. So how did this self-taught man, with such a highly developed sense of his own self-worth, build up one of the largest companies of his time? Steve Jobs' life is above all the story of a man who wanted to dominate the world through IT, a cruel world with no holds barred. Steve Jobs was born in San Francisco, California on the 24th of February, 1955. Things didn't get off to such a great start as his biological parents abandoned him at birth. His mother, a student who was single, and his father, a young teacher of Syrian origin, couldn't take care of him, so he was adopted by Paul and Clara Jobs an average American couple who never had much chance to study. But the jobs is resolved to bend over backwards to send Steve to university. The young Steve grew up with his adoptive parents in the south of San Francisco in this small suburban bungalow in the heart of a valley filled with apple trees, soon to become known as Silicon Valley. But all that was still to come at the time computing was only in its very early stages. At school, Steve was not a great pupil and was often bored. One subject did interest him, however, electronics. Still, the boy was no genius. Kind of an amateur, hobbyist, tinkerer, enthusiast uh, in electronics, but he, he wasn't um, a brilliant, accomplished mind in the technical uh, aspect. Steve Jobs may not have been a genius, at least when he started out, but he had the right friends. Especially one, his neighbor, Steve Wozniak, who was five years older than him. They shared a passion for electronics, with one difference. Steve Wozniak really was a whiz kid. We meet Steve Wozniak, Jobs' former accomplice, at his home in a cozy district in Los Gatos, California. Here they come. He remembers spending hours on end making things as a youth, thinking up all sorts of electronic systems, and he didn't do too badly out of it. Ah, oh, there comes little Z. I was so excellent. Um, over the years, I just developed tricks that were in my head, tricks of combining chips that... Um, it's, it's hard to believe how I did that. You can't tell another person. You can't lead another person to develop what I developed. I just did it because I tried as hard as I could for years to do better and better and better jobs without reading any books on how you do it. Steve Wozniak's past exploits still continue to amaze him, and with good reason. He was always very advanced, a genius even. He was reading by the age of three, and at seven, he made his own radio. By the age of 13, he knew a great deal about electronics. He produced invention after invention throughout his teenage years, the most outstanding being the Blue Box, the first telephone that could be used to make unlimited phone calls all over the world for free. You put these tones into the phone, and it starts seizing phone lines, 
and then dialing numbers for free. The phone circuits, the phone systems, equipment starts connecting you to, to numbers everywhere. No billing. The phone worked perfectly, but it turned out to be illegal, so Vosniak could not do anything with it. A few years later, he was to invent the machine of the future. This is it. This wooden box made with whatever materials Vosniak had on hand. It looks rather like a toy, and yet it is the first personal computer in history. Despite its rather homespun appearance, it is nothing less than revolutionary. The year is 1976, and at the time, computers still look like this. Vast machines that fill up entire rooms with no keyboard and no screens. There's still a far cry from the home computer we know today. Compared to this great mountain of a machine, Steve Wozniak's version is a spectacular improvement. But, as usual, he does not grasp the full scope of his invention. Until the day he shows it to his friends, and in particular, to Steve Jobs. I could go out on some tables and set up my Sears TV and my computer that I was working on designing and show off what I had. And I started getting people around me that were so amazed at how so few chips, one little board, was a whole computer. For Steve Jobs, the machine is a revelation. From that point on, he has just one thing on his mind, to market the computer. Steve Wozniak remembers the absolute determination of his young 21-year-old friend. But we didn't really have the idea to sell it. When Steve Jobs said, let's sell it, and I said, we may not make our money back, and he said, that's okay, we'll have a company. And Steve Jobs has already thought of the little detail that would make all the difference. Well, he came up with the name Apple Computer, and what an amazing name. Apple. Wherever did that idea come from? Steve Jobs had been very influenced by the hippie movement, as well as by a mystical journey he'd made to India. In the early 1970s, Steve aspired to the ideals of the generation that wanted to change the world. Protest movements, music, drugs, he tried them all. To have a blast, his group of friends would meet up in a commune on a farm, eating apples. Dan Kotke remembers it well. Steve and I and my girlfriend and mutual other friends had all stayed at that farm. It was an apple orchard. We had spent time harvesting apples. And since we were fruitarians at the time, we were fasting on apples. Inspired by the hippie movement and also in homage to Sir Isaac Newton, who discovered gravity having received one on the head, Steve Jobs chooses the apple as his logo. The missing bite on the right side is to stop it being mistaken for a tomato. All the young hippie manager needs now is to find some clients who are interested in his revolutionary computer named Apple One. Very quickly, Jobs receives his first order, 100 units from the Byte Shop, one of the first computer specialist stores which has just opened in Silicon Valley. Biographer Owen Linsmayer remembers the extraordinary salesmanship that Steve Jobs displayed that day, in spite of his hippie image. You know, here's a young kid, basically a hippie, you know, walking around in sandals and shorts and a beard, coming in and asking for uh, 30 days credit for several thousand dollars worth of parts uh, to build an unproven computer in an unproven industry. You know, back then, there was no microcomputer industry. There was no personal computer. There was just these guys with dreams in a garage. When Steve announces his first sale to his partner, Vosniak can't quite believe it, especially given that they haven't even built a single computer yet. When he got an order to sell fully built computers for $500 each, a hundred computers is fifty thousand dollars that was twice my Hewlett Packard salary that was a big number that was a financial shock with the first fifty thousand dollars behind them they still need to manufacture the computers which they do with whatever resources they have at hand they hire their friend from their hippie years Dan Kotka who becomes the first Apple employee 29 years later Dan Kotka takes us to his first workplace This is Cupertino. We are almost here. Here's Chris Drive. And it's well worth the journey. One of the largest companies in the world started out here at Steve Jobs' parents' home at Mom and Dad's. This is where I stayed in the summer of 76. Apple Computer started in Steve's sister's bedroom, which was in the back of the house, but then it moved to the living room. And 
Actually, we were doing we were doing the Apple One on the living room coffee table when I showed up, and then we were kind of moving it to the garage. Dan worked for several months in this garage, which has since become a legendary U.S. landmark. Dan is not much of a handyman and is certainly no computer whiz, neither is Jobs, but he hires Dan to do the soldering at $3.25 an hour. Not a bad wage at the time for a lowly technician. At the time, I didn't know anything about computers, so I was just kind of tagging along. And Steve and Steve, you know, had a whole plan of what they were doing, and I had no idea what they were doing. I was just trying to help. <laughs> Manufacturing their products in a garage, hippie-style managers, Apple's first steps are a little outlandish, but their Apple One computer earns critical acclaim, and in the space of a few months, the company sells over 200 units. Not bad for a piece of equipment, which up until now has been the sole preserve of IT boffins. Apple One looks a little basic and is even sold without a screen, which means its users have to hook it up to a television screen all by themselves. Operating it requires both computing and do-it-yourself skills. The Apple One you cannot call a personal computer, and here's why. You had to be a technician to buy one of those. You had to know how to hook wires according to some diagrams on a sheet of paper. You had to learn how to hook up some monitor or get a signal into your own TV set. You had to figure out how to buy some transformers to get voltages into the computer. And so it was a little bit you had to know some things to build it. Steve Jobs is quick to realize that a clientele restricted to computer experts and initiates is just not enough. His ambition is to sell home computers to the mass public. So he asks Wozniak to refine his invention and make it accessible to the public at large. Wozniak gets right to work and hands in the fruit of his labors a few weeks later, Apple II. What's in here is all of the code that was in an Apple II that made it operate. All this code without a single bug. So you must be pretty proud of yourself. Uh, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> I never do that again. <laughs> yes, I am proud. I'm proud. What if that was? Yeah. Bosniak has no idea how he did it. Steve even less so. But they have something the others don't have. Vision. Firstly, it has a lot to do with the design. Apple II has lost that homemade appearance. It's enclosed in plastic casing and comes with a monitor and a disk drive. Jobs has just transformed some obscure machine into an object of mass consumption. The Apple II was revolutionary in that it was the first computer of the time, the personal computer of its time, that was a complete computer that was ready to go out of the box. It was really a consumer device. All that remains now is to convince American families to acquire this future product for their homes. And Steve Jobs has the answer to that one, advertising. This is his first campaign. The Apple II is represented at the heart of family life. From the comfort of his own kitchen, Mr. Apple II owner can check his shares on the stock market. In the late 1970s, that still belongs in the realm of science fiction. And that's where Steve Jobs' genius lies, bringing technology into our daily lives and, 20 years before the era of Internet, being the first to imagine simple, useful, and entertaining products that will change people's lives. It's 1970, and young engineer Andy Hertzfield has just been hired by Jobs. Andy remembers the new computer's dizzying success the moment it went on sale. Selling 1,000 computers a month was a huge hit uh, for Apple. They were happy to sell 1,000 computers a month back in uh, 1978. The two founders pose proudly for posterity. By the early 80s, their adventure has become a success story. Just four years after starting out in the garage, the small firm has become a key Silicon Valley company. The Apple II has conquered America. 300,000 units have been sold, and now it even equips schools. U.S. school kids learn computing on the Apple II. In the late 80s, the young company is listed on the stock market and the floodgates open. Nearly 5 million Apple shares are snapped up within minutes and the company's value leaps 32% on the first day. The two young Steves become millionaires overnight. Jobs is 25 and Wozniak is 30. Their combined net worth is $300 million. Their lifestyles explode accordingly. This is Wozniak's Porsche with its Apple II license plate owned my own house in my life. I'd never have enough money. I didn't think I'd ever have enough money in my life for a, a vacation to Hawaii, even. 
That's, that's, that's how I was. And uh, all of a sudden, whoa, now I've got everything. Yeah, so um, it, was, it was a nice feeling. But gradually, the brilliant inventor withdraws from the company, preferring to devote himself to his passions, cobbling together strange inventions, or even organizing big folk music concerts. What's more, having Steve Jobs as your partner isn't easy. He just never has enough. He wants to control everything, absolutely everything. For Jobs, the adventure was only beginning. The young boss of this first startup in history becomes the darling of the media. Icon of a new generation, he features on the covers of top magazines presented as a guru of Silicon Valley. And his aura spreads across the Atlantic. Here's how he was presented on French TV in the early 80s. The example to follow, the goal to reach, is that of the employee who becomes a millionaire by setting up his own company. Such is the case of Steve Jobs, inventor of Apple microcomputers. He was on the cover of Time magazine when he was 27 years old. Um, he was worth hundreds of millions of dollars and was a cultural hero in his 20s. Steve Jobs, who already was not exactly modest, would become a total megalomaniac. His goal was to become the undisputed leader of the IT world. Nothing less would do. This is 1981. The IT sector is dominated by IBM, at the time one of the world's biggest multinationals. Employing over 350,000 people, it makes most of the world's mainframe computer systems. Yet that year, IBM in turn decides to take on the personal computer market by launching the IBM PC, largely inspired by the Apple II. Will this heavyweight competitor manage to undermine Apple's newfound supremacy? The response of Jobs and his teams is a definite no. They didn't believe for one second in the future of the IBM PC, and they even chose to celebrate with fruit juice. We rushed out and we got one and immediately started taking it apart. And we just started laughing at when we saw how, po how poorly it was designed. Initially, the people at Apple looked at the IBM and said, what a piece of crap this machine is. It doesn't do anything you know, interesting. It's not, you know, doesn't have uh, the graphics capabilities that this has. It doesn't deal with the disk operating system the same way ours does. It doesn't have the software. It's a big, clunky, ugly box. Yet despite Steve Jobs' scorn for the PC, it sells well. It even eats into the Apple II's market share. But its success came down to just three letters. But that big, clunky, ugly box had the letters on it, IBM. And for too many people in that, at that time, IBM was a safe bet. And they were willing to buy IBM over anything else, no matter how good the competition was. His pride hurt, Steve Jobs decides to react. Convinced of his superiority, he wants to crush IBM. It becomes his obsession. And to lead this war, he sets out to recruit a businessman. And not just anybody. John Scully, the CEO of Pepsi-Cola, the man who made his reputation by shaking up one hell of a competitor, Coca-Cola. The teaming up of the two men is headline news. Their plan to take on IBM even makes the cover of Business Week. Steve Jobs has no doubts whatsoever, as illustrated by the way in which he asked Scully to join him. That famously is how Steve Jobs helped attract John Scully to come to Apple. He said, do you want to make sugared water or do you want to have a chance to change the world? To change the world. Such was the mission of Steve Jobs. And he'll go all out to make it happen, whatever the cost. Steve Jobs now devotes himself 100% to carrying out a major project, a computer so avant-garde that it would outstrip its competitor, IBM, for good. Its name, the Macintosh. To design it, he demands total devotion from his teams. His Apple engineers must be willing to sacrifice everything. For Andy Hertzfield, it wasn't all happy memories. He came over to my cubicle. He goes, You're, I got good news for you. You're working on the Mac now. And I said, great. Uh, just give me a day to finish up uh, this Apple II stuff I was doing. And he goes, what, what's this, what stuff are you talking about? What's more important than working on the Macintosh? And I told him my Apple II project. And he goes, that's, that's no good. It'll come to nothing. You're starting on the Mac now. What he did was he took my Apple II and he pulled it out. He pulled the plug out. Uh, so I lost everything I was working on. And he didn't stop with that. He picked up the Apple II and started walking away with it. He pushed his employees to the limits. 
You know, there's a famous story that he had t-shirts made up for the Macintosh team that said working 90 hours a week and loving it. 90-hour work weeks. After three years at this frenetic pace, the Macintosh is ready at last. Planned launch? January 1984. Yet 1984 was also the title of a novel by George Orwell, a futuristic book denouncing a totalitarian society dominated by a dictator, Big Brother. Steve Jobs wants to use its message. He calls upon Ridley Scott to shoot a commercial. Let's show them why 1984 won't be like 1984. It depicts hordes of gray, expressionless people marching robot-like into an auditorium to hear Big Brother's speech. This all fit into Apple's vision of the world as Big Brother, IBM, and them as the saviors to Big Brother. Hence, the slaves in the advert represent all those employees condemned to use IBM computers in their company while the young rebel sportswoman obviously stands for the Macintosh. One cause, our enemies shall talk themselves to death, and we will... They were going to break people free from the oppression of mainframes and boring stuff and business, and Apple was going to save everybody. January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. The reason why the Macintosh doesn't feature in this advert is because Steve Jobs wants the privilege all for himself, that of presenting his baby to the entire world. Andy Hertzfeld recalls that famous 24th of January 1984, the day that Macintosh was revealed. You know, I hope they can and show the whole other curtain. Yeah, they do. Be, just everyone's going nuts. That day, before a full and frenzied auditorium, Steve Jobs staged his own consecration. You've just seen some pictures of Macintosh.